sharing uh, the screen change. So if you give me the access, that would be great. Okay, you can give me the go ahead, Shane, whenever you think we can start. Yep, go ahead there, Mara. Okay, great, great. Um, I just want to welcome everybody, first of all, for joining us um, this afternoon. And um, this is our third Inuit Galway Rural Studies Centre seminar. And uh, today I'm absolutely delighted, uh, I suppose, again, to um, thank the Department of Rural and Community Development who runs the seminar alongside us and to thank my colleagues in the Rural Studies Centre in Galway. But today, a special welcome to our two speakers. Um, Dr. Mara Van Tolivar is uh, from Utrecht School of Economics, uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And Dr. Lucas Olmida is from the Department of Food, Business and Development in Cork University. University Business School, University College in Cork. So this is our third seminar series and uh, both of our speakers today will highlight the potential of rural social enterprises as contributors to rural development and they will present their research which has analysed the engagement of rural social enterprises within their local contexts and which will reflect then on the benefits and limitations of rural social enterprises as partners when contributing to rural development. So we're really looking forward to Mara and Lucas's um, presentation. And if you have any questions, we, we've we found over the last few weeks that using the chat has been quite successful. So if you have any questions throughout the presentations, feel free to, to pop them into the chat and um, I have Louise Weir and of course Shane Conway is uh, doing a lot of the work in the background as well. So myself and Shane and Louise will try and pull out some of the questions for um, Mara and uh, Lucas uh, after their presentations. So we'll continue until maybe about the 20 to 4 mark and then we'll break for um, some comments, questions via the chat. OK, so um, thank you very much. I think we can go ahead and share your presentation. Yeah, thank you for that introduction Mara. and for the invitation for us to uh, to be here. So I'll just share my screen with you guys. So I hope you can see the presentation now. Yes, that's fine, Mara. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Um, yeah, so as introduced, I will um, start with um, explaining about the research that Lucas and myself have conducted together with uh, Dr. Mary O'Shaughnessy, um, mainly in light of a Horizon um, 2020 Marie Slodowska um, Career Innovative Training Network called Reaction. This was a pan European network that was focused on um, research around social innovation and social entrepreneurship, specifically in structurally weak rural regions throughout Europe. Um, and both Lucas and myself had the um, opportunity to conduct our PhD re research within the Irish context um, within this program uh, that was under the supervision of uh, Dr. Mary O'Shaughnessy and um, our second supervisor was uh, Professor Dr. Tia Hennessy, also from uh, UCC. Um, so we had the uh, opportunity to do a lot of our research um, actually together, so throughout this presentation um, we will um, show you some of the results um, of that based on some of the work that has been published around that in the meantime um, as well. So in that light, I will just start off with uh, a short introduction uh, of social enterprises, specifically in a rural setting, um, and explain a little bit about a systemic um, literature review that we have conducted, uh, share some of the findings of that review, and I will also explain a little bit about the role that um, rural social enterprises can play in processes of neo-endogenous development. And then Lucas will take over to explain uh, a bit more about the general uh, research framework that we used uh, to investigate engagement of rural social enterprises, specifically with their place, with that local context in which they operate. And from that, he will uh, draw some conclusions um, towards place-based solutions for rural areas. So just to kick off, like social enterprises in itself um, is definitely not a new phenomenon, um, but over um, the past years, they have become increasingly popular as, um, as actors that can provide potential solutions for a wide range of different societal 
challenges that we face. And one of them in particular being rural development. And this is amongst others evidenced by the increasing number of uh, policy reports, both on a European as well on, a, on an Irish level that link social entrepreneurship, social enterprises specifically um, to processes of rural development and highlight the positive contributions that they can make in that light. Uh, one of the most recent examples um, is our rural future, the rural development policy uh, that came out in 2021, which very specifically mentions social enterprises as potential contributors to processes of rural development. Um, yet from an academic perspective, we don't know a whole lot about how these organizations um, actually operate in this context. And that's where um, Mary and Lucas and myself um, found our combined research interest. And one of the first things that Lucas and myself started out with um, when we started our PhD trajectory was to gather the knowledge around rural social enterprises, specifically in a rural context, to see what exactly do we know about these organizations at this moment. Um, so this was around 2018 that we started this. Um, so we conducted a systematic literature review in which we looked in um, two scientific databases, AB Inform and Scopus. Um, and we ended up with 66 articles uh, that specifically um, uh, empirically investigated rural social enterprises within the European territory. So we did a thematic analysis um, on those. Um, just to give you an insight, actually one of the interesting um, and more descriptive statistics that came out of that is that this link of social enterprises and rural areas is actually pretty recent because of those 66 um, articles that we included, um, over 80% of them was published after 2010, so in the, in the last decade. Um, so what did we find? as the characteristics of these type of organizations. Um, first of all, that they have a strong um, local or community focus and that they are very often very collective organizations that have a strong collaborative mindset. They are uh, described to fulfill local needs that are not met otherwise, so that are not met by the public or the, or the private sector. And that in that they um, don't focus on um, on one type of impact, but they often combine social, economic, um, and in some cases also environmental goals. And in order to do that, these type of organizations actually combine a wide range of resources. Uh, this can include financial resources like different types of, um, uh, of income, uh, like market-based income that they generate through uh, the sales of services and activities, but also uh, grant income or fundraising, um, but also different types of human resources. So for example, uh, paid human staff uh, combined with voluntary efforts. And in order to access all those different resources, they need to build relations with a very wide range of different stakeholders and also at different um, spatial skills. So they're not limited to their own locality, but they actively try to get access to resources from um, from a regional or national or sometimes even an international level as well. And one of the interesting findings um, as well that other research pointed out is that um, there is somewhat of a gap between the policy discourse and actual support. So in the policy discourse, there was this positive story about rural social enterprises being able to contribute to these processes of development um, within um, their places, but at the same time, um, some of the papers that we reviewed um, concluded that the actual support kind of lacks or was not specific enough to actually help this specific type of organization um, to develop. And there was a great need um, for a context sensitive policy that helps to deal these that helps these organizations to deal with um, that specific rural setting in which they operate. And that policy framework was actually something that in an Irish context uh, we found very interesting as well. So in one of the other um, papers um, that we published, it is published in the uh, um, Irish Administration Journal, uh, we have looked specifically at Irish rural social enterprises in light of the, the new national um, policy 
around social enterprises um, in Ireland. Um, and this study um, looks at survey data that was gathered as a background information during the process of developing the first social enterprise policy in Ireland, which was um, published by the uh, Department of Rural and Community Development in um, 2019. So we analyzed 258 surveys uh, filled out by social enterprises, rural social enterprises across Ireland to actually see what type of organizations are these. Are these all the same organizations or are there differences in, um, in the characteristics? Which means that, you know, if they are different, you are likely to have a different trajectory of development um, and also different needs for support. So we did an analysis of these um, 258 surveys and we actually um, found um, five different types of rural social enterprises based on differences in their in their business models so in the type of income that they generate uh, which could be for example largely market-based income or grant funding or a combination of things also in the level of income that they generate so there are some that are relatively small in terms of income others that generate um, more financial income on a yearly basis but also differences in organizational focus so for example um, a very local or more regional level or um, a focus on a specific sector building community infrastructure for example or um, operating more in uh, the area of leisure arts um, tourism um, Another element is the um, level um, of paid employment and voluntary engagement. So all these different factors combined led us to these, these five um, different clusters of type of rural social enterprises. Um, and to us, this heterogene heterogeneity in the type of organizations that operate in these rural areas suggest that also if you want to have a social enterprise policy to support them, you need to be sensitive to that and to their different needs um, for development. Um, and not only, of course, the type of organization matters, but also the rural context in which they operate uh, matters. Because, you know, we talk about the rural, but there are actually different types um, of rural out there. Um, as well, and um, so the, the other step that we took was to look at rural social enterprises specifically as actors within this process of um, rural development. And there we actually find that um, the characteristics of rural social enterprises as we found them in the papers that I um, just explained to you is actually um, naturally very um, closely linked to neo-endogenous rural development, uh, which in a nutshell is um, rural development focused on maximizing the local potential of uh, a specific place by combining both local as well as extra local resources, networks, um, capital uh, to stimulate development. So in neo-endogenous rural development, like um, a, net a network of local actors is connected to external um, influences and um, um, local assets are combined and um, um, yeah combined with uh, extra local sources so in the characteristics of rural social enterprises as we found them in previous research we saw that rural social enterprises naturally have this very strong um, local focus based on the local assets that are there, but at the same time, they um, look beyond their own locality uh, and they can be considered, as some um, authors call them, boundary spanners um, that really build external relations at different spatial scales. Um, on the level of innovation, like new industrial rural development is linked to um, social entrepreneurial activities and innovation and in rural social enterprises we see this translated in the fact that they combine a wide range of resources um, that allow them to come up with new solutions that have not been um, tried or implemented by other partners so in combining this wide range of resources they have this resourcefulness to 
um, to deal with the context which they're in and to create very um, specific solutions that fit that local context. On a governance level then, uh, new endogenous rural development advocates this multi-scalar uh, and multi-sectoral um, uh, arrangement in which uh, the public sector, the state, is mainly a facilitator. Um, and translating that to rural social enterprises, like naturally um, in, um, again, the previous research explained, they, these organizations really have this form of participatory um, governance. They include multiple stakeholders for it, within their governance structure or within their uh, decision-making structure. And um, we also see that sometimes they can take this intermediate position between the, the local, um, the local market um, and the state. And in that they also combine elements from the public sector, from uh, a more commercially driven market sector and from um, a more nonprofit oriented um, civil society. So they combine elements um, in which they also have the ability to bind stakeholders from these different sectors to the organization. So in the light of integrated development, new endogenous rural development um, uh, really advocates this diverse production uh, and service economies driven ho holistic approach um, to placemaking. And that very much relates to rural social enterprises that don't, um, uh, that don't just address one type of impact, but that very often combine these different types um, of contributions on a social, on an economic um, and or an environmental level as well. Um, so in that sense, rural social enterprises are naturally um, seem to align very well with these um, expectations of new endogenous rural development. Um, Yet that previous research also shows that there is a small bit of a gap between maybe the policy expectations or the general expectations of what these type of organizations can achieve um, and actually the, the evidence and the support to make that work and to really um, 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 harness that potential that these organizations have to contribute to these processes. So that's why in our research, we have focused very much on specifically how these organizations um, engage with the place, with the local context in which they um, operate. And I will hand over now to Lucas, who will explain you a bit more about the specific theoretical framework that we have used for that um, and some of the findings that result from that. Okay, thank you, Mara. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, so continuing with the, yeah, with the storyline of Mara. So in order to to study and to analytically examine this connection between social enterprises, rural social enterprises, and endogenous rural development, we developed this theoretical framework that you can see over here. So basically, we draw from the substantive view of the economy developed by Karl Polanyi at the beginning of the 20th century. And this, the main message of this uh, socioeconomic theoretical framework is that economy and, and economic relations are embedded within society and within the nature. So one cannot study economic relation separate or detached from these social relations, social institution, historical context and natural env environment. He also proposed that against neoclassic economics, economic relations are not only formed by market relations, that is one of the three forms of economic integration that he proposed. So his market relations are one of them, but they tend to coexist with other two types of economic relations and forms of economic integration that are important. One of them is redistribution, that basically is uh, one central point, central authority that gathers resources and after redistribute throughout the populations. So for example, in European the contemporary democracies could be the role of the welfare state through the taxation system. They collect taxes and after develop public services for the population. And the third form of economic integration is reciprocity that they refer to these relations of mutuality between different groups, different communities, different organizations that are mainly based on the social bonds between the individuals, but they entail an economic transaction. The economic transaction 
usually is non-monetary in reciprocity relations, so it can be gifts, it can be in-kind don donations, or for example, the transfer of a piece of land from an individual to a social enterprise in a rural community, but they can, or volunteer labor, for example, is also included in reciprocity, but it also can entail some monetary transactions, such as, for example, donations or sponsorship from a local business to a, a social enterprise in this case. However, we, we feel, we, we found that this uh, socioeconomic theory uh, developed by Polanyi, it means uh, for our purpose of analyzing uh, social enterprises as an endogenous rural development actor, this conceptualization that uh, is geographically sensitive to the, to the local context and to the, to the yeah, geographical settings and, and context where this organization develop their activities and their services. So in this uh, light, we, we draw from some uh, scholars on geography, such as Tori Massey or John McNeil or Tim Creswell, to introduce uh, to the theoretical framework the concept of place and the three dimensions proposed by John McNeil uh, of place. So we, we consider important uh, the location of the social enterprise. So in the rural area, rural locality where they are based, this where is seated in the map the geographical coordinates, but also the natural environment, the natural surroundings. Also the local, which refers to the material and institutional settings where social relations occur. So this can be the buildings, the streets, or the institutional context where these uh, social enterprises develop uh, relations. And also in a more symbolic and identitarian meaning, like the sense of place, which refers to this emotional attachment of individuals, but also collective organization to the place, to the rural locality, the rural area. So for example, it's this collective or individual sense of belonging towards the, the rural locality. So in this slide, we also uh, incorporate the notion of spatial scale. So we, we argue that these relations can happen at different and geopolitical, geopolitical level, so it can be at the local, regional, national, or international level. So our main uh, argumentation over here is that social enterprises tend to combine these different forms of economic integration, but also they tend to engage with different dimension of their places in order to contribute to this endogenous rural development. When they do so, uh, our, uh, we wanted to examine that when they, they do so, they develop or enhance their corporate, corporate agency that this is draw, drawing from Margaret Harker uh, realist social theory. So basically what is important here is that they are, uh, they enhance this collective action of rural localities, of organizations in order to pursue this vested interest for the development of the localities. This is a bit the, the theory, the theoretical framework that we develop in order to analytically examine the role of social enterprises as rural development actors. So, but today we are going to focus specifically on, can you go to the next slide, Mara, please? Yeah, so we are going today to focus specifically on one of the sites of this theoretical framework. So we are going to present our findings of the engagement of the rural social enterprises with the three dimension of the places where they develop their activities. And this is due of the importance from the research that Mara has presented, that we saw the importance of the context of the different characteristics of the rural context, such as geography, policy, socioeconomic factors in the work and how they influence the work of these social enterprises. So if you go to the next slide, please. So basically the methodology of the, of the findings that uh, I will present right after, uh, we develop four in-depth case studies of rural social enterprises acting in different rural localities in Ireland. Uh, the four um, cases are based on the South Midwest of Ireland. So basically County Limerick and County Cork uh, in different rural localities that they are slightly different. So I will explain a little bit later on. So we spent uh, more than 15 months uh, visiting the social enterprises, the cases mainly weekly. So we visited each social enterprise once a week, more or less. And we collected different, lots of data with different qualitative methods. So for example, we collected more than 70 interviews with multiple stakeholders, including social enterprises staff, board members, volunteers, but also local representatives 
from local from SMEs in the localities, uh, local representatives from community and voluntary organizations, local development company staff and CEOs, regional development experts, and uh, local represent politicians, local representatives both at local and national level, and um, yeah, to have an overview of the of the different views about this, the role of the social enterprises in the localities and in the rural areas. We also conducted participant observations. So we participated and observed different kind of events like um, community events, but also the daily work of the social enterprises, the activities we visited the fields and engaged in informal interviews with different members in these meetings. We also participated in regional and national meetings where the social enterprises were invited or attended board members for meetings, for example. And finally, we analyzed more than 100 documents from the social enterprises, like, for example, minutes from previous meetings, uh, financial statements, or historical uh, documents that they have, uh, and also uh, documents about the region, the localities, the areas, uh, such as local community development plans. and different stuff. We analyze all this data through a thematic analysis following an iterative process. So basically during these 15 months and a bit after, we went to the field, collect some data, came back to our MVPO software, analyze the data. We come back to the field and we, we collect more data, more focus in this case, and we were refining our findings throughout all this process. So it was a bit of a long and tiring process but we can stand over our results pretty confident in that we have deeply analyzed and focusedly uh, collect our, our data, analyze it like in depth. So if you go to the findings, Mara, please. So from this analysis, we have developed for, for today, for presenting to today this table in which we relate like uh, how, how social enterprises engage with different dimensions of their places and how this engagement has uh, come to develop some changes in the locality, but also how this analysis shows some limiting and hindering factors in the engagement with these different dimensions of their places. So for example, in terms of location, our findings show that the social enterprises use their natural resources to create services. So one of the examples in, in one of the cases, they have a uh, they have been like a signal of civilization for more than 6,000 years. So they have developed a heritage centers and tour guides around these historical sites and the natural surrounding, not only it's for attracting tourism, but also to show the local population the, the importance of the place and the historical uh, relevance of where they live. In terms of, they have also harnessed the location in terms of where they are situated. So for example, one of the cases is situated in a national road with great passing traffic. It's a tourist uh, place also like a passing route through that it goes to Killarney. So they have developed the community social enterprise, a restaurant uh, in order to provide the locals with a, with a restaurant that it was the first in the locality, but also to harness this passing traffic. So to engage with tourists that they can stop in the in the village and enhance local spending and all this kind of stuff. About limiting and hindering factors, so we observe that uh, those social enterprises operating in, in weaker local markets or regional economies and in more isolated or disconnected places, because our cases were not in very remote rural areas. However, they show some heterogeneity in terms of connection connectivity. So some of them were in national roads or close to to, to good roads, we can say, uh, but others were much more isolated in terms of being only through local roads or even with problems with the internet connection and this kind of stuff. So this means a limiting factor in, in terms of uh, harnessing resources to develop their services and their projects. Also, this is connected with the limited population to draw, like usually these less connected places are smaller in the sense that they, so the cases uh, range from 200 inhabitants to until 1000, but we can see the difference that the, in the smaller villages, it was much more difficult to engage people with a diversity of skills and more people to implement projects and all this stuff. In terms of the local, we divide it into materiality and institutional settings. So in terms of materiality, we observe 
how the social enterprises revalorize and underutilize assets such as either pieces of land, derelict buildings in order to develop their services such as social housing, community centers or the restaurant that I mentioned above. So they change the ownership and the use of these assets from private to community hands, basically. About the limiting and hindering factors, uh, and we observe how there were a lack of uh, avail or limited availability of land and buildings in order to develop the projects. So in some communities, communities were really uh, challenging for them to develop projects because they don't have the physical space to develop them. And this is quite connected with the existing ownership, ownership structure in some rural localities, where for the social enterprises were very difficult to purchase a piece of land or a building because the people who owned them were not living in the community anymore and they didn't want to get rid of, of the place. Uh, some people were reluctant to, to sell the stuff because they want to keep because of historical things or well, different kind of stuff. In terms of institutional settings, we saw how uh, the social enterprises enhance the link between the community and the public authorities or institution, and mainly uh, local authorities, also some connection with regional bodies and even with national departments. Through, for example, the signing of service contracts, for example, in terms of adult education courses or community employment schemes, for example, and also elevating local demands from the community, so acting as local representatives of the community towards their demands uh, to local authorities, for example. So if they want uh, some projects to be done, they contact the social enterprise and they went to the county council or wherever. Uh, however, about the limitations, uh, we saw that those uh, local authorities, local development companies working in a more centralized way or more focused on silo programs, uh, focusing much more on SICAP or LEADER or in a more silo way, they suppose they, they meant a limiting uh, factor in order to harness resources for the social enterprise. It was also mentioned in great bit like the reduce of public expenditure was a, a hindering factor for the work of this social enterprise. And also the challenging, they have challenges in when coordinated the different or aligning different interests of different stakeholders. So some of the projects developed by these social enterprises needed the collaboration between public authorities, private owners or individuals and other third sector organizations, for example. So it was challenging for them to align all these different interests in order to develop a specific project that they have to, to align, to coordinate these very different stakeholders. And finally, in terms of sense of place or so the more symbolic or identitarian uh, dimension of place, our findings show how uh, the social enterprise engage local people to work for the community, so they enhance this uh, participation, this collective action towards the benefit of the development of the community, for example, like uh, opening or developing these community events in which uh, people from the community were engaged from the designing to the implementation phase, developing community planning and consultation processes and all this kind of stuff in order to create this collective sense of be belonging towards the, the place. And about limiting and hindering factors, uh, well, we, we observe that typical internal community conflicts that they hinder this participation of people and this attachment of people. So it was also a bit of a conflict between some people who has this emotional attachment to the place. They didn't want to touch anything and to stay everything like it was, or other people who were thinking a bit more that the places need to change and all this kind of community conflict between different visions of the development of the people, basically. So if you please, Mara, pass yeah, to the next slide. So in summary, and in a bit in a more abstract level, uh, we conclude, we, we, we analyze that uh, within heterogeneous rural context, the contribution to the endogenous rural development of social enterprises is based on their engagement, uh, their integrated engagement with location and institutional material, material and identity dimension of their place. So they tend to combine this engagement with the different dimension of place into a uh, cohesive relations in order to develop their project. And they do through four different mechanisms that we call harnessing locational aspect, navigating regional frameworks to enhance institutional connectivity, 
revalorizing existing underutilized material settings, and leveraging individual attachment and enhancing this inclusive collective sense of belonging. So our argumentation is that when they combine these different mechanisms, they contribute to this kind of endogenous rural development. This is a bit more explaining in an article that we published in the Journal of Rural Studies. And to, to conclude, if you can go to the last slide. Thank you, Mara. So to conclude, we put the question if uh, social enterprises are relevant actor to go towards place-based solution for, for rural areas. So basically our findings, first of all, show that they can act as these uh, contributors to place-based and indigenous rural development because of the services that they have developed, the projects and the way that they develop this. However, we also wanted to put some notes of caution into this uh, role of social enterprises in endogenous rural development, because the findings also show that they really need these effective collaborative frameworks with other rural development stakeholders, so that they cannot act by themselves and in isolation to other uh, develop, rural development stakeholders, but they need really to collaborate and to effectively collaborate and be complementary to public authorities, for-profit businesses, especially local SMEs and other third sector organizations. And then in beyond the locality, this especially sensitive policy that address and balance these structural disparities and inequalities be, be, between rural areas are necessary in order to, to balance these different rural areas development because the social enterprises by themselves are really the ones we studied at least are really locally focused. So it even they can even uh, enhance the disparities between different rural localities. Uh, when, for example, they, they compete for uh, competitive resources between different rural localities, the ones who are well more equipped, more structured, they tend to harness the resources in detriment detrimentally to other localities. So they can even uh, increase these disparities and inequalities between different rural localities. So we argue that they, they, they really push an integrated development within their localities, but we cannot say that they, they push this, uh, this integrated development in a more uh, higher level, so between different rural areas because of the nature of strong local focus and all this kind of stuff. So other mechanisms are needed to balance these inequalities between rural areas. So just to conclude and to finish and open up the discussion with all you, we can say that rural social enterprises can be significant actors in endogenous rural development, but they really need to be complementary to the work of other stakeholders and not a substitute to them. And this is very connected with sometimes uh, social enterprises are seen as filling the gaps of public services, for example. So our argumentation is that more than filling these gaps, they work well when they complement uh, public institutions and public services so they can and they, they offer other staff because they are more innovative, more entrepreneurial, but they should not substitute them by maybe complementing them or working collaboratively and creating these synergies between different stakeholders. So that was basically our presentation of today. Thank you very much. And yeah, we're happy to take questions, discuss whatever you feel like. Yeah. Um, Luca and Mara, thank you very, very much. Um, it, it really is, I think I'll, I'm going to get you, to, yeah, I should stop um, sharing. And, and most definitely, I think, you know, as you said at the very beginning, that 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 10 year, um, I suppose, um, literature that we have there based on social enterprise is really where we're at in the last 10 years, seeing social enterprising enterprises increasing rapidly and I suppose that was maybe one of, of of my own questions really was this idea of this fear I suppose that social enterprise has in some rural villages and some rural towns become the substitute for possibly government bodies putting in funding into different areas that this idea of the social enterprise is filling that gap and it can be um quite difficult in many respects uh, you know for that to happen and for a local rural community to get the funding that they deserve then so i suppose were you seeing that a lot out there were you seeing that you know in the areas that you did the research that there was you know social enterprises becoming that substitute for what should be funded. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. We the organization that we studied, some of them they they really do public services, like for example, developing community crash, or even healthcare, or even yeah, these community employment schemes. They are the po contact point, so they really develop quasi public quasi public services. And one of the things is that in some of the cases, uh, in in the village was this strong so community-based social enterprises, which has developed a lot of services, but you go to the next village that they don't have this organization and they have nothing over there. So in this sense is what I was saying at the end that it can even increase the inequalities between villages and rural areas because um, it's, yeah, it's this kind of retrenchment of the public services and they are saying basically that social enterprises well, or community organizations, they have to fill these gaps. So this is a bit of our argumentation too, like they can be yeah, interesting actors, innovative actors, entrepreneurial and social entrepreneurial. So they have this social mindset, but if you see them as a, yeah, a substitute of the public services, it's, it has some dangers on that. Mm. Yeah. Can I maybe add to that that Yes. Um, something we haven't touched on um, is that specifically in these small rural communities, like Lucas said, you know, there's a limited amount of people that you can draw on to actually run the organization. Um, and if these organizations really become these focal points of a lot of important services in the area, um, you know, the um, um, the challenges dealing with with burnout, dealing with you know having to run these services for the local community, you don't want to give up on that. Uh, but also maybe volunteer fatigue, you know, people who have been uh, involved in these enterprises for for decades, they maybe also want to do something else in their spare time. Um, you know, that's that's also I think a point of caution to keep in mind that yes, these social enterprises um, are very well able to tap into these local resources, but somehow. You know, that doesn't mean that the public sector can step away and say, look, it's up to you guys now, because that's a big burden for a local community um, to carry as well. So that's an additional argument that that, that support should still be there um, and that these organizations can work complementary to that and not mm -hmm. as a substitute for it. Absolutely, Mara. And I'm, I'm going to call on Vincent Carver, who's here with us as well. And Vincent has a question in the chat. But again, I suppose just while Vincent is coming in there, he might ask his own question that he's put in. Um, but I suppose in, in many respects, we, we kind of sometimes disassociate social enterprises from volunteer workers and volunteerism. And we kind of think about enterprises and funding and money and a little bit of capitalism. And we forget that they are actually volunteers, just as you said. So I might call on Vincent maybe to uh, ask his question there, Vincent, if that's okay. Thanks. Yeah, no problem, Mara. Thank you. Apologies for any background noise. I'm in a I'm in a central area. Apologies for any background noise. Um, I suppose my question really uh, synergizes with with Mora's in, in my own view. I suppose uh, so. In relation to your view of the local and that institutional part um, was the regional investment by local authorities equivalent to that of the rural enterprises. Uh, I'm really wondering whether you feel that rural enterprises felt well supported um, in that. I think every enterprise would tell you that they can always use more money. Um, so that's it, I think. Um, um, there was maybe a bit of a, a difference in the connections that these organizations had with um, a regional, uh, the providers of regional funding. So in some cases, over the years, they have developed a very good working relationship. There's a very close working relationship. Um, and um, they do feel um, this support. Um, but Lucas, like, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there are also some cases in which they feel more disconnected um, from these regional bodies. Um, and I think specifically, you know, because we looked at two different counties, you can see also a level in which that is organized at a county level. Um, and in cases in which it was very siloed, so in which 
um, funding for different types of activities was really administered to very siloed uh, departments. It was more difficult for these rural social enterprises to connect to that because it takes them a lot of time to go from one department to the other and to connect those. Well, uh, if there was a bit more of a structured regional approach, it was usually easier for these enterprises to connect into that and to build this uh, more long-term working relationship um, that also provided them with more access to uh, um, to funding. Yeah, if, if I can add a, a small point, uh, our uh, cases were based on County Limerick and County Cork. So it was interesting that in some of the cases, uh, they were a lot of complaints about the amalgamation between uh, Limerick County Council and City Council, as they feel that the engineers, the people from the council have mainly gone to the city. So they had previously to the amalgamation, this closer connection that they went to, to the regional town to talk to the people. And now they have to go to, to Limerick or even the, the people in the local authority, many of them did, did, didn't know where the village was and how the village looked like. So this kind of more centralized way of working uh, of the county council in, in this in this case was a, a concern for them like this this connection with the local authority that previously and it's interesting for Mara and I we are not from Ireland so for us the first shock was that in Ireland you don't have a municipal authority so in our countries you have a council in every municipality so you have a local representative in every municipality that you can go but you have that in a way there is so we felt that this uh, organization that we studied, they, they feel a little bit this gap. So they were sometimes the representative of the community to go to the local authority uh, in our countries is the local authority is, is in a municipal level. So it's much in a, in a community level than in Ireland. So we saw this kind of, whereas in, in other cases that they have a really, as Mara said, a really close connection with the, the local engineers and they, it, it was very fluid because they were chatting or linking every month basically so it was mainly a bottom-up process so mainly it was the, the organization who went to the council to ask for demands to to elevate local demands rather than the council going to the village asking what do you need and it was also an interesting pro process for us that in our countries is a bit different i think yeah which, which is really good to see the difference between, you know, the different countries and how we react to things. Um, Felicity Kelleher has also, Felicity's joining us from Waterford, I think, today. So, Felicity, if you want to pop on and, and ask your question yourself, you're, you're more than welcome to do so. I'm not sure how my connectivity will be more. I'm, I'm a bit of a distance from Waterford. Greetings from, from Denmark. Um, okay. <laughs> in terms of um, the research, well done, guys, on the research. I know I've, I've, I've seen your work before, so it's great to see it in, in lights again. I wondered whether, in terms of social enterprises existence in rural communities, whether they were always in the absence of commercial entities in these communities, or whether you could see commercial entities and social enterprises hand in hand in the same community. Shall I go to the, thank you, Felicity. Um, good to see you. Uh, yeah, our argumentation is a bit like they, they can complement each other rather well. In some of the cases where the local business community was strong, uh, they really work together really well in the sense that, for example, uh, the local businesses provide a sponsorship to, to other projects that they don't develop and the community social enterprises develop. But also, the, the, on the other hand, uh, for example, when organizing community events or Christmas market, the local business really appreciate that the social enterprise uh, organize this, uh, these events because they draw people from other villages that spend money in their businesses. So I, we felt that in these cases were more a win-win situation and a good collaboration between for-profit local businesses and social enterprises, or community-based social enterprises. And in some cases where there were very little local business, so we have one case that is only one local business, for example, they really struggle because they, they miss this sponsorship, these, these skills from more entrepreneur, more business minds. So that sometimes they even, went to other villages close by to ask for this kind of skills and resources. So I would say that they 
can complement each other. Like, yeah, through this exchange of resources, mindsets, and all this stuff. Absolutely. I'm going to call on Louise uh, just to see if there's any more comments there, or Louise wants to call on anyone else. Yeah, thank you for an amazing presentation. I just think it's very timely. We see often see these policies coming out and they're so enthusiastic for the future on the opportunities that, that are there for rural. And as you said at the outset, social enterprises are, you know, now the panacea for this. But until research like this comes out, the complexities and the interdependencies that are behind all of this, we don't know that. And then rural communities can't take advantage of that. And I think the way you have outlined it will just see where these barriers are. How can we, so when often rural will say, well, it's, it's so, um, heterogeneous, you know, how do we actually make a policy context specific? But it is through research like yours that we can do that. So you can then start breaking down the layers and seeing where it's at. And I think that response probably comes in on Jennifer's point saying, well, community and volunteer burnout is a real issue in social enterprises. And that's one strand that responds to this. Um, when you tear away those layers, it isn't very responsive to put a blanket policy approach to say, let's put out money for social enterprises. It, it is down to capacity building, community capacity, resources, and what they have at the doorstep. So I think your research is timely and I think it has so much to offer. Another point more I wanted to make was from the outset, Mara, when you spoke about your literature review, it is so in depth, but what I really liked about it was both of your ability to actually, you had one framework and you thought, gosh, this is lacking something here. And you jumped into a whole other different philosophy, a different discipline, and you shan't use that lens to actually bring forward what is needed for social enterprises. And that's also needed in this, in this vacuum of, you know, we don't have the knowledge. How do we move social enterprises? And it does mean sometimes we have to come out of our comfort zones or our own little disciplines and use different lenses to do that. So that transdisciplinary thought is really powerful. And I just wondered maybe when you mentioned this gap between I'll have to see what you wrote, the policy discourse and action. I think that's really powerful. That's where we're uncomfortable and you're sitting in there. And I wonder how you feel now, what you can do, what your research can say to policy, or what would you love to say to someone? This is the, this is the answer. Or what, what have you come out with? That'd be really interesting. Who's gonna go first? Am I taking the first <laughs> shot, Lucas? <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that. Um, and I think, you know, our advantage was that that we could really um, build on all the knowledge that that um, Dr. Mario Shacknessy had in this, uh, this field uh, and work together a lot to really, you know, uh, make those steps. Um, and I think in relation um, to policy, like, like for me, the main takeaway um, from our research is indeed there to look at at those different organizations that are out there. You know, we talk about a social enterprise sector, but these organizations um, in themselves are so different and the, um, the rural context in which they are placed um, uh, is also um, very different, like some of the, the differences that, that Lucas pointed out. Um, so I think if you, you know, from a policy perspective, if you want to create this kind of you know, level playing fields in which everyone has a chance to to contribute to to their development. It's important to take that into consideration, um, and to um, you know indeed dive into those um, those characteristics and those those clusters of organizations or those clusters of rural challenges um, that are there, and specifically focus your your support on that, not only indeed, as you um, pointed out in terms of funding, but also in terms of that capacity development in helping people um, people build the skills to, to do it for themselves um, in a way that's sustainable for them as well. You know, that's not only sustainable um, from an economic perspective for the business, but also from a social perspective for the community and for the individuals um, that are in there. So, um yeah i think you know dare to to embrace those um uh, those differences that are there and use them to your uh, uh, advantage to have um different enterprises different regions learn from each other um because there's a lot of you know innovation and entrepreneurial minds um, out there that really want to help their their local communities um, and that with the white support 
uh, have the potential to do so as well. Mm. Absolutely, Mara, some, some very interesting um, ideas and remarks there, because I'm not sure if you want to come back in there. Um, Jennifer, actually, Jennifer, if we can call on you for a minute, if you want to come on, you have a couple of comments there. So we're happy to bring you in there if you want to. Hi, um, I suppose I'm, I'm kind of tooting my own horn with the last comment. In other words, if that's my job so as a rural community development officer, um, I'll, I'll toot the horn of my colleagues rather than myself. I suppose I just I found Lucas's comments really interesting and I suppose a lot of the stuff, Clare County Council has a rural development strategy. It was the first local authority in Ireland to develop a specific rural development strategy and I suppose it was done a number of years ago, it's been renewed at the moment, but out of that four rural and community development officers were employed to cover the county and to kind of be that bridge between the local authority and between the, um, the community sector. So like my whole background is in the community sector so it's like an interesting straddle between the the municipal requirements and the needs of the community so I think very much a lot of the points that you were making around those challenges and as was picking up on what Vincent said is that you know is there space for commercial activity and um, I think certainly in some of the communities we would work in depopulation is a big fear and communities feel for their own protection and sustainability into the future, they need to have services in place that will draw people back to live. Now, that's been a really interesting place to look at in terms of COVID and lockdowns and remote working. People have moved into parts of rural Clare that would have been quite depopulated um, and whether that's going to be sustained into the future. But the communities almost feel an obligation then in their voluntary capacity to be able to provide things like the older person's care or the childcare setting um, being run as social enterprises in order to, to maintain draws. So I think things from my experience on the ground, it's great to see some of those connections being made in, in the research and it's just really, really interesting. And I'll definitely be sharing the information with them, um, with my colleagues. It's thanks so much for the, for the insight. Thank you, Jennifer, for, for the comment. Yeah, Please. thanks, Jennifer. And I think this also really relates to, um, you know, the point I made about from a policy perspective, embracing those differences like these, these very regional local focused knowledge that you and your colleagues have, um, like throughout the research program. Uh, I had the opportunity to work a lot with Valley Harbor Development, a local development company there, and I was always amazed by, you know, the in-depth knowledge that they have. And you clearly also have that of your local communities, um, you know. I think such a decentralized approach is really the way to make this work because you are the people that have that knowledge uh, and that can be that link between maybe, you know, the, the policy on the national level uh, and really help local communities to translate them to their local um, opportunities and challenges at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Mara, thanks a million. Uh, and I think with that, we, we might have to draw um, our, our seminar to a close, but it actually, you've raised a very good point there. And I think that is one of the uh, ideas around our Rural Voices seminar series that we give the opportunity for researchers to bring forward the theories, the ideas, the research that they have carried out. But we also, um, you know, really need these people on the ground to work in that space, those practitioners, those policy makers, and um, those rural development officers you, you know we desperately need those those people who who do the job that we kind of write about and talk about every single day and these people that have the experience of exactly what we're talking about and writing about and I think that networking that synergy that connection that we're making on Rural Voices is exactly what we wanted and what we needed um, so I, I'm, I'm delighted that that point was brought forward at the end of our seminar um, but also um, I suppose to Mara and Lucas, look at you wanted to come in, come in there for one second before we finish. I was just clapping to your comment. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. But uh, absolutely, uh, I, you know, I really wanted to, I think social enterprise has such an important space in contemporary rural development. It's something that we really need to be so mindful of and particularly looking at all of the challenges you've mentioned, you know, and to keep our eye, I suppose, on the idea that it's often volunteers that work within social enterprises and we need to make sure that they, those are, are maybe treated as volunteers, but also that very strong connection that you talked about so well about place and the context around place and space. 
and the importance of social enterprise within those spaces. So I think you've done that exceptionally well today. So we've really been enriched by um, your presentation and we want to thank you both most sincerely and to Mary O'Shaughnessy as well in UCC um, uh, via her, her work that she has also done in relation to social enterprises. Um, I also want to thank Louise and Louise Weir and Shane Conway that are, are with me again today. And I want to thank to the Department of Rural and Community Development who um, work alongside us within uh, this space of our Rural Voices seminar series. And I think we're back again the last Wednesday of the end of April, again from three to four, and we will publicize the new seminar within the next uh, few days, I think. So again, uh, thanks to everybody. Thanks for logging in most definitely and for registering and joining us for the seminar today. And again, thanks to Mara and Lucas. So um, thank you very much and good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Meet you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.